Okay, start recording. All right. Hey, guys. Um, for this little, uh, I don't know, opening act, I'm going to teach you how to juggle. Now, I've been juggling for many, many years, probably since I was in junior high, something like that. Um, this is a, a bean bag from my original set of juggling balls. Uh, these are from back then there was a book and some juggling balls and there, it's probably still around called Juggling for the Complete Klutz. And this is the one bean bag I have left from that set I had as a kid for Juggling for the Complete Klutz. Um, I have these two other bean bags, again, Juggling for the Complete Klutz bags. Um, this one I think was from my very best friend who kind of took it up, screwed it around and then said forget about it and he gave me his balls and I have one left. And this was from my first girlfriend um, back in junior high, right? I mean, weird. Um, same thing. She tried it, fun, okay, whatever, and then she gave me her bean bags and I have one left. So I actually have three originals left. But for this um, little lesson, I'm going to use some professional uh, juggling balls. I have got these only recently. I don't use professional gear. I could never afford it. Um, but it's easier for you to see. So we have three balls. We're going to start with one. We're going to start with one, kind of talk about positioning and, and exercises and so forth. So first of all, when you hold the ball, you tend to hold it in, the, in your fingers. You don't hold it in the palm of your hand so much, it's mostly in the fingers, all right? It gives you a little bit more lift and so on. Your elbows are, you know, 45 degree angle or so to start with and not super tight, but not way out here, just kind of naturally laying. And then you wanna go ahead and toss the ball from one hand to another, just like this. Now, there's a few things to think about, all right? First of all, you notice the height is maybe just a little bit above eye level. You're not throwing it way the heck up there, and you're not just throwing it across like this. You're going a, just a little bit above eye level. You also notice I'm leaving my arms where they were originally, and I don't have to hurl it or do big body motions. It's pretty small motions with the arms. So you know, it's almost like you're a mannequin with just your arms going back and forth just a little bit, okay? Now, I know this sounds weird, but you really want to practice this for like five minutes or so. Or I know it's getting lower, but you want to practice this for about five minutes or so because you want the feeling to be really natural. You don't want to have to think about the height, you don't want to have to think about how much you're moving your arms, and you just want it to be, to be a natural kind of muscle memory toss. Now, as you practice, you're going to find yourself slipping. You're going to find yourself doing big motions, you know, laying your arms down and kind of, no, no, you really want to focus on the toss, okay? Now, once you've done that a while, you want to pick up a second ball. And it's really just two tosses, one from one to the other. Now, I'm moving this out of the way. Oh, sorry about that. I'm moving this out of the way because your first exercise is going to be to throw them one, two, and let them drop to the ground. And when they drop to the ground, you should hear them fall one, two. So, for example, one, two. All right, they fell to the ground, I assume you could hear that somewhat, in a one-two fashion. I threw with the right hand first, now I'm gonna throw with the left hand first. One, two. All right, now here's the idea. You're gonna be really tempted to like throw one and get the other one out of your hand as quickly as possible. And so they're gonna kind of go at the same time. So you're gonna go, and, and that's not right, okay? So you just want to let them fall to the ground, one, two, switching your starting hand each time. So start with the right, one, two, and then start with the left, 
one, two. So one more time, one, two. And then with the left. All right. So once you've done that a few times and you have a real good sense for the rhythm, just catch them. You already know how to catch them. You've practiced for five minutes. You ought to be able to catch a couple of balls, right? So you just go one, two. And you want to hear that slap, one, two. Now start with the left hand. And there you go. And you just go back and forth from the right hand to the left hand, starting with the right and starting with the left. And you want to practice that for a good five minutes or so. You want that to feel super supernatural. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Okay. Now, now we're going to add the third ball. Now, I know this sounds weird, but even when you were doing two, if I just go back to one, two, one, two, one, two, the third ball was already there. It's just always in the air. Okay. So it's really not physically different to juggle the third ball. It's just that mental leap that, oh my gosh, now there's three balls and I only have two hands, right? But trust me, the motion is the same. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with letting them drop to the ground again. This time we want to hear one, two, three. So starting with the right hand, two balls in the right hand, we're going to toss them one, two, three, and let them drop one, two, three. You see? And then you go ahead and start with the left hand. Toss one, two, three, drop one, two, three. All right? And you're going to do that over and over until you got that really nice one, two, three rhythm. And then you catch it, right? You're going to start with two in the right hand, and you're going to end with two in the left hand. See, one, two, three, and then back the other way. One, two, three, two in the right, one in the left, now back to left, one, two, three. Just going back and forth, starting with the, with the hand with two balls in it. All right? That's juggling. That's juggling. And then you just go ahead and instead of stopping with two, you just go ahead and do the third in there. So, for example, we start, we go one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and then one, two, three, four, five, and so on and so forth. It's the same thing every time. Is How do I put this? Truly, this is really no different than this. It's just there's one more ball in the air. That's all. Okay? But let me show you this one more time, right? If I start with two, I am going to juggle with an invisible third ball, right? There's an invisible third ball in there. And so this back and forth with two is no different than three. So if you can juggle two balls back and forth, you can juggle three. All right? So there you go. Give it a try. Have some fun. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. Yes, let's get started indeed. I hope that was fun, interesting, informative. I'm actually, we're going to explore this more next week. Um, next week, I think on Monday, there will be puppets in trying to figure out how to approach this whole uh, opening act thing. Um, welcome. I hope you're having a great week. Yeah. So I have, I don't have, well, okay. I have a window in my studio. Puppets. No. Um, I have a window in my studio, but um, I've covered it and everything because one of the things about a studio is you really need to control the light. That's important. So I can't see outside, but by the sounds of it, it's starting to come down, starting to snow. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll have to be careful about that when I go pick up my wife. 
Um, as you know from a previous opening routine, I pick up my wife and drop her off every day, and she works up at the University of Utah. So um, uh, I use her car, though, and she has four-wheel drive. It's awesome. Okay. Hey, let's get started. Um, retail. Okay, now here's the thing, guys. And um, just so you know, this is, this is something that literally keeps me up at night. I, I, uh, the measure of success for me is the degree to which I can help you think about something you already know in a new way. And that is especially difficult if the thing that we're talking about is boring, all right? Retail is all about that, right? Retail, it's not too terrible. You, you know how retail works. Somebody buys something, they mark it up, they sell it to somebody else, that's retail. You get it, you understand it, and it's not like it gets people all excited to think about retail. Right? It's, it's just not. But I'm going to do my best with the help of Aristotle, right? Um, I'm going to, uh, we're going to talk about retail in sort of a new way, a way that really kind of showed, shows how retail is such an invention. And furthermore, not always a good invention. All right? So we're going to kind of look at retail through the lens of Aristotle and, and in, in his work, The Politics. So let's get my highlighter out. And, oh, hey, you know what? Let's go ahead and reset these from my previous class. Don't worry. You're going to bring them right back up, right? As a matter of fact, ah, heck, I don't know. But we've already had lots of people... You know, coming in, uh, it wasn't re referenced the past lectures, I apologize. Um, we already had lots of people coming in and talking and saying hi and so forth. So I want to give you some credit for that. But now we'll get the real ones. Okay. Retail. Okay, so you remember this from what was it, Monday? We've got ourselves a marketplace now. All right. So how did the market come, place come about? Well, all right. We have this sort of thing of division of labor coming up. Instead of everybody being their own farmer and their own craftsman and their own blacksmith, and I do my own carpentry and I do my own sewing and knitting and, and all the... Yeah. That's, un, that's not sustainable. So we have this division of labor going on in which everybody kind of specializes in one aspect of whatever is necessary to keep the society going. So you remember that, right? And we, you remember that we then kind of had to bring all these people together in a marketplace so that we could buy and sell these, these goods and services that we don't supply to ourselves, right? So I don't make my own juggling balls. I actually did once. They sucked. I don't make my own juggling balls. So I have to go somewhere to buy the juggling balls. So I go to the marketplace. All right. So we got that. Um, but remember, and this is going back to when we talked about business transactions at the very beginning of these lectures, Remember, we're talking about transactions that create value for everyone, all right? Remember, and you guys were the ones that came up with this, it's not simply I have a whole bunch of something, so I want to sell it, and you have a whole bunch of something that I need, so you want to sell it, and so we trade back and forth. It's also I can create more value with what you gave me, and you can create more value with what I gave you. So it's not that two sections of value, two amounts of value just traded places. It's they traded places and then both went up. Ah, I look like Michael Jackson. Thriller. Anyway, so the idea is that 
value is created out of the trade. It's not just simply a switch back and forth of sixes, six one way, half dozen the other, that sort of thing. Value is created. Furthermore, value is created for society. Okay, so bear those three things in mind. Division of labor means we need to go to a marketplace to get the goods and services we need that we don't provide ourselves. The trading of something creates additional value beyond that which existed in the item anyway, and that value is for the good of society. Okay, that's important. All right, so, all right, you guys remember that. Move on, Lon. Okay, well, let's play with something here. Online arbitrage. You guys, whether you know the word arbitrage or not, you know what online arbitrage is. Um, nevertheless, for those of you playing at home, let's play with it for a moment. And trust me, this will mean something. So I put the chair in the wrong place, so now I can't bring that over. So one, do it right. Take your time, set it up properly. Yes, mother. Okay, so here's the idea with online arbitrage. Trust me, this is going somewhere. So I'm going to say that this is Walmart, okay? Walmart online. And this over here is Amazon online. Actually, Amazon does have brick and mortar store. I think one in Seattle. Anyway. So here's the idea with online arbitrage. You go, hey, you know what? I see that there's an item here um, on sale at Walmart online, walmart.com, for $5. And I see that over here in Amazon, it's going for $10. Now, I know the extremes are never that high, but bear with me, right? And so online arbitrage says, you know what? I'm going to buy this item here at Walmart for $5, and I'm going to then put it up for sale over at Amazon for $10, okay? Now, here's the thing. This is your home right here. That's your home. Hey, little chimney, smoke coming up, garden, door. Okay, move on. That's your home. Well, you could ship the thing to your home and you could unpackage it and change all the packaging and repackage it and rebrand it and so on and so forth and then put it up for sale at Amazon using your garage as a warehouse. But that's a pain in the butt. So what you do is you, you buy it, but then have it sent to, and I forget what the term is, um, there's an actual term for this fulfillment center. Um, gosh, but these folks for say a $1 fee will, um, repackage it. They'll, they'll change all the codes, the SKU codes and all that sort of stuff, which you need to do. And then they hold it in their warehouse. And then when you put it up for sale at Amazon, they then ship it off to Amazon who then ships it off to wherever right? And so by doing this, by buying it here and selling it here and paying them a dollar to do it, you've made yourself a profit of four dollars. And you never touched it. You never touched this item. This was all done on the computer, okay? That's online arbitrage. Now, the question is, and the question that Aristotle wants to talk about is, um, where's the value? How did you create value for the community in online arbitrage? Okay, so how did society benefit from your work? Now, don't get me wrong. Yes, you clearly created wealth. You clearly created wealth um, for yourself, $4 on that purchase. 
and you created some wealth for the people who did the packaging. They got a dollar out of it. You created wealth, money. But what value did you create? How did society benefit from you touching, or not even touching, you interacting with that? Okay? Now, here's the thing. Um, Aristotle would contend that you didn't create any value. You did not create value for, for society, okay? Um, it's not that you had access to walmart.com and nobody else had access to it. No, anybody who's purchasing on Amazon has equal access to walmart.com. So you didn't create value there. Um, you didn't make something that was rare in one area more plentiful. No, it's, it's an open ecosystem, right? Well, let's talk about why Aristotle would say that. He says, listen, there's two kinds of wealth, all right? Natural wealth, what he calls natural wealth, which is doing things natural for natural reasons, not to get rich, okay? And then there's pecuniary wealth, right? Which profit-seeking, greed, avarice, and ambition, okay? Now, Michael here real quick says, what marketing advertising is being used to inform or promote such a service um, would be entrepreneur. You see, here's the thing, and we're gonna talk about marketing and advertising later on in this series of lectures, because that's a whole new you know, can of worms there, right? Um, I am not contending that this is not entrepreneurial. It's highly entrepreneurial. I'm not contending that um, it doesn't create wealth. We're just looking at this for, through the eyes of Aristotle for a moment. But then we'll kind of talk about today's world and what we think. Um, okay, so let's do some reading. We're going to read, and I'm sorry, I'm going to move my chair up a little bit. I like to be closer. We're going to read a bit here from, um, from Aristotle and see what he says. And we're going to break down. We're going to critically analyze what he says, which means we're going to break it down to its constituents parts, assess what he's saying, and then, you know, think about it in today's world. Okay, so this is what the guy has to say. Of everything which we possess, there are two uses. Both belong to the thing as such, but not the same manner, for one is proper, ooh, so proper, this particular use, and the other, the, um, the other improper or secondary use of it. Now, we're going to use shoes as an example. By the way, online arbitrage is used a lot for shoes. Shoes are in right now right? Um, um, scalpers. Okay, Mauricio, hold on to scalpers because I'm going to tell you a story about scalpers. But this is why that, you're right, you're right. Okay, so here's what Aristotle says, and he's going to use shoes as an example, all right? For example, a shoe is used for wear and is used for exchange. Both are uses of the shoe. Okay, I don't have any shoes in here. I don't have any shoes. See that picture? Am I pointing the right way? No, I'm not. See that picture? Those are shoes. So shoes have two uses. You can wear it and you can use it as a medium of exchange, meaning buy or sell or trade, right? Where? Buyer, seller, trade. Those are the two uses of the shoe. He who gives a shoe in exchange for money or food to whom, uh, to who wants one, does indeed use the shoe as a shoe, but this is not the proper or primary use for a shoe. It is not made to be an object of barter. Okay? So, here's the thing. Oh, wow, we will be talking Machiavelli later. Um, yes, you can use the shoe as an item of barter, 
totally fine, right? If you don't have a shoe and I have extra shoes and I use it as an item of barter with you, I'm using a shoe as a shoe as an item of barter, but that's not the proper use of a shoe. Not proper as in, oh, so proper. It's just shoes made to wear, right? So let's keep going. Let's see what Aristotle has here, right? Oh, and by the way, we're going to come back over here. Okay. The same may be said of all possessions, for the art of exchange extends to all of them, and it arises at first from what is natural, from the circumstance that some have too little and others too much. Okay, this is totally normal, he says, and I'm totally copacetic with it, says dear Aristotle, right? He says, listen, some people have too much of something. Some people have too little of something. It's just natural for us to exchange so that we can meet the needs of one another, create value, and contribute to the state, the economy, the society, right? That's normal. This sort of barter is not part of the wealth-getting art and is not contrary to nature, but is needed for the satisfaction of men's natural wants. Okay, now here's where Aristotle is kind of fixating, right? He says, listen, we all have natural wants. We need food, water, shelter, clothing, security, tools. We have things we need to live our lives. But anything beyond what is necessary to live your life is pecuniary. Pecuniary is a cool word to learn. You're going to use it a lot in the future, so pick it up. Meaning it's beyond what is necessary to live. Now you're just talking about wealth, greed, avarice, things like that, okay? So let's keep giving this guy the time of day and see what he says. We're going to stick with him. When the use of coin had been discovered out of the barter of necessity, articles arose. Um, the, the art of wealth getting, namely retail trade, okay? Now that we've invented money, and we've talked about this in this lecture series, we've invented money for legitimate reasons, but now we've got retail going on, right? Which is, at first, probably a simple matter. At first, retail is simple. Hey, I have all these, I have a lovely bunch of coconuts, right? Whatever. I have all these coconuts. Tell you what, I don't want to go down to the market I, I don't. So I'm going to sell it to this guy who's going to take them to the market and he's going to resell them. But he's going to resell them at a little bit higher cost because he wants to be paid for his service of taking them to the market for me and selling them. Right. Simple, simple. But became more complicated as soon as men learned by experience whence and by what exchanges the greatest profit might be made. Okay, now totally what I normally do here, folks, is I say, hey, have you watched The Big Short? All right, great, great movie. The, the Big Short is not only compelling and informative, but is also funny as hell and infuriating. Because what the big short tries to do is explain, even at the tiniest level, how the housing market fell apart back in like 2007, 2009, right? How did the housing market just collapse? And the movie, the big short tries to explain how it works, but even the movie calls out and they even call it out in some pretty humorous, irreverent ways. The movie calls out, we can't tell it the way it actually happened because it's too difficult to understand. Nobody understands it. And the people who do understand it don't want you to understand it. They want to keep all the knowledge and they want to confuse and bamboozle you because they want your money. 
Now, that's normally where I'd leave it. But GameStop, dude, GameStop. GameStop is a great example of how, you know, where what he's talking about here became more and more complicated as soon as men learn by what by experience whence and by what exchanges the greatest profit might be made. Now, I'm not going to sit here and try to explain GameStop because A, you probably know as much about it as I do. And B, I don't know, we don't know much about it at all. You might think you know it, but you don't, okay? But it's a great example of how people are artificially on both sides, both the old institutional big, huge people and the little guy are artificially manipulating um, economies and markets and perceptions and all that sort of stuff in order to make money. Aristotle would be freaking out at this sort of thing, okay? Um, oh, Jordan uh, Belfont commented about GameStop and the bill, Big Short. Yes. And by the way, and I'm not making this up, people, the guy who wrote the book, The Social Network, upon which the movie was made, he is writing a book about GameStop, and that book has already been optioned as a movie. This thing is so hot that they've already optioned a movie on a book that has not been written yet. It's amazing. The point is that these markets are insanely complicated. And it's only about wealth, uh, only about getting money. You're not adding to society. We're not exchanging less for more and so on and so forth. And we're using a proper company like GameStop as a pansy. One's trying to make the, the stock go down, shorting it. The other's trying to prop it up to break that short and to make more money. And GameStop's like, dude, we're just trying to sell games. But everybody else is turning it into something it was never meant to be. That's what Aristotle's talking about, okay? Indeed, riches is assumed by many to be a quantity of coin because the arts of getting wealth and retail trade are concerned with the coin. This infuriates Aristotle. He's saying what's happening with retail trade is we're no longer concerned about exchanging value, creating more value for the state, the community, the collective as a whole. Now we're just fixated on getting coin. We're just talking about coin. I sound like the witcher. Oh, how much coin? I'll do it for coin. All right. Last part. Well, no, not last part. Others maintain that coined money is a mere sham. We've talked about this, haven't we? We know that money is fake. It doesn't exist, right? A thing not natural, but conventional only because if users substitute other commodity for it, it is worthless. And because it is not useful as a means of any of the necessities of life, and indeed he who is rich in coin may often be you know, in the necessity of food, here's his point in all of that. Money, if we agree that is worthless, is nothing. Food has value. Tools have value. Shoes have value. Homes have value because they can be used to create more value right, and used to sustain life and to enrich a community. Whereas Aristotle's saying, you can't eat money, all right? So it really bugs him that we're doing all this commerce in slippery ways just to create wealth in something that doesn't exist. And he ends with, how can that be wealth which, which a man may 
have a great abundance and yet perish with hunger, like Midas in the fable, whose insatiable prayer turned everything that was set behold before him into gold. Okay, so this is his hang-up, right? And by the way, you guys have been chiming in with some, some great stuff, so I'm going to go ahead and, and add in a couple there. Um, now, and Scott says, but we can use money to buy something to eat. Yes, if money has value. Remember, um, money only has value if we agree it has value. And if we don't agree it has value, then it has no value. So I'll give inflation, right? And we're going to talk more about this in future lectures. Uh, every Sunday, <clears throat> my wife and I pick up our son. He's mentally handicapped, lives in... in Anyway, I'm not going to tell you about, you know, my, my woes with my mentally handicapped son and institutions and so on and so forth. Point is, we pick him up every weekend. And when we drive home on Sundays with him, he loves McDonald's nuggets and fries. So every Sunday we do drive through and we get him nuggets and fries. They've been going up in price. They've been going up in price. We've noticed this. Um, by the way, a good friend of mine owns that McDonald's, so one of these days I'm going to give him a hard time. Um, well, then that means that my money has less value than it used to have. Well, if it only goes up in price that much, it's okay. But at a certain point, it's going to go up in price so much that you can't afford it. And therefore, no, you can't buy food with money, right? Anyway, um, Michael James, uh, since we are adding questions, I might ask one, one later. That's fine. Uh, hyperinflation will cause money to be worthless and cause of economic failure. Uh, you know, good example, you know, Nazi Germany. You don't even need to go back that far, baby. Venezuela here in the last five years or so, right? Venezuela has taken it in the mega shorts, right? Um, I see some conversation going back and forth, so I want to add that there. Um, yeah, it's it. As soon as we lose money, faith in money, then it has no value. But you're never going to lose faith in food. You're gonna never going to lose faith in shoes and a jacket. Right. That's why Aristotle says that jackets and shoes and food have natural worth, whereas things that are used in just exchange have an unnatural worth. That's the distinction he's trying to make. And Scott, to be clear, I use money all the time. I'm not trying to talk us out of money. As a matter of fact, it would be in my best interest that you keep believing the beautiful lie that money has value. Um, you know, so, you know, now, Later on, Michael, we're going to talk in depth about advertising and aggressive marketing. Oh, my gosh. When we start talking about consumer economy, look ahead in the live streams and you see like in about a month and a half, we start talking about consumer economies and so forth. Oh, yeah, we we go deep into that. OK. All right. OK. Yeah, Michael, you get it. OK, so. Let's talk about, so let's talk about this whole thing of natural versus unnatural wealth, right? Um, so um, household management, the art of household management, necessary, natural, and honorable. So if, if you are exchanging goods and services in a retail way, to just maintain your house, live a good life, provide for your family and so forth, you're great, you're great. Honorable, noble, you're in great shape. However, if you're engaging in retail trade to um, just build wealth and to get richer and richer in terms of, of um, coin, right, then Aristotle has real problems with you. Now, remember guys, this is a class about where certain ideas began. It's not a class about history, right? 
So later on in this series, we're going to talk about things of usury and so forth. You know, how much markup is appropriate? It's an interesting thing. When you hear that somebody is making 20% profit on something they're selling you, you might be inclined to say, yeah, 20% profit, that sounds about good. Yeah, okay, overhead and work. But when you find out that something is marked up at 3,000% profit, you're like, greedy? Why is this marked up at 3,000% profit? That is usury. That is immoral. I'm not going to pay that. I'll be damned if I'm going to enrich you that much. Where did those ideas start? Started with Aristotle. If you've ever begrudged somebody too much profit, that's because you thought they were reaching a little bit much. Okay, so now here's the thing though, baby. I like wealth. I'm, I'm saving for my retirement, okay? My wife and I, we've been kind of late to the party. Oh my gosh, I could just go on and on and on, right? Uh, about stuff that you don't care about. Oh, probably the class, but never mind, right? My wife and I are late to the party in terms of, um, of, of saving for a retirement and we're getting more and more of these. Good for you. Um, so I want wealth. I want some dollars. I need dollars in that account so I can live on that and so forth, right? And, you know, money, the root of all evil and so forth. Let's take a moment and, and, and agree with Aristotle for a moment. And let's answer the question, what are the risks of putting pecuniary wealth ahead of natural wealth? Now, let me make sure we understand that question. Natural wealth is I need money for food, shelter, clothing, transportation, safety, security, utilities, to be able to enjoy a nice, simple, minimalist, not minimalist, but a nice, simple, but noble life. That's natural wealth. Pecuniary wealth is, I want more money. Why do you want more money? Because more is better than less, and money is better than not. So I want more money. That's pecuniary wealth, greed, greed for greed's sake. What are the risks of putting pecuniary wealth ahead of natural wealth? Let's go ahead and Sorry about that. I pushed a button that I didn't mean to. Let's go ahead and play with that idea for a moment. Tell me what you think.
Okay, very good, very good. Let's go ahead and play with it. By the way, before we do that, we're gonna go ahead and bam, and we're gonna go ahead and take this up, and, um, and let's go ahead and say, great job. So our, our timestamp, let's see, what's our timestamp gonna be? 1036. Let's go ahead and put a timestamp of 1036, right? And you know the deal. Send me an email after the lecture with 1036, and uh, there'll be a little something extra in your bank account. Pecuniary, right? Okay. All right, let's take a look at some of these. You guys are on a great roll. Um, the poor would stay poor. Adrian, the poor would stay poor and the rich would be rich. A higher power wants to stay, you know. Yeah, and the rat race. Here's the thing is that it, Aristotle would agree with you, Adrian. It puts the focus on the wrong things, right? Whereas Aristotle is very concerned about the state, the community, right? The collective. How can we help the collective? Um, pecuniary wealth puts the focus on me, me. How can I get ahead? How can I outmaneuver that person? How can I manipulate that person? How can I cheat that person to get ahead for me? Um, and that's a real thing. Right now, there's this advertising campaign um, on TV called uh, In Utah. And they're really trying to push people, encourage people to spend in Utah, to vacation in Utah, to do local in Utah. And for very good reasons, the Utah economy needs help because of COVID. And I've actually made the commitment that anything I build in my office, and I spend a lot of money in this studio, anything I do in the studio, I have to buy locally. That's a rule I have. Um, but pecuniary doesn't care about the collective, about the state, about the community, only the self. Um, some other, if we always go for pecuniary, says Scott, um, prices would skyrocket on everything. Yes, it really does. And then Jack came on and said, pecuniary wealth loses its value. It does. Okay. Um, Food is always worth food. A home is always worth a home. You can always live in it. You can always use it, right? If you maintain a home, if you maintain a car, you can always use it in its natural state. You can use the car. Whereas the value of that car, you know what they say when you buy a new car, it depreciates in value the moment you drove it off the lot. It does. And that's the pecuniary side. That's the retail side. A car will always have value of it as a car so long as you maintain it and, and it's running fine. But its value in terms of retail is always going down, okay? So yes, pecuniary wealth is always depreciating. Good point. Uh, Adam, I think, society, I think in a society, if so many people are looking for pecuniary wealth, their markups uh, could potentially make it more difficult for others to achieve household management or, a, or ha natural wealth. Okay, um, let me support what Adam said here, all right? Let's look at housing costs in Utah right now, in the Salt Lake Valley, right? The cost of housing, I just read in an article over 2020, 2020 the, the value of housing here has gone up 19% in one year, 19%. The average home in the Wasatch Front, in this valley and so forth, is around $400,000. Now, if you're a homeowner, ooh, that's sweet. That's fantastic. Oh, wow, look at my wealth. It's going up and up and up and up. Affordable housing is a real problem in the Valley right now. Now, you've probably noticed that they're building apartment complexes and condos and townhomes on every freaking corner. Well, that's because they're trying to... I'm fidgeting with stuff and dropping it. That's because they're trying to catch up. Affordable housing is a massive problem. So... 
if you are somebody like me with grown kids and these kids are out there trying to build a home, build a future, build a life in Salt Lake and the Wasatch Front, it's really difficult. They cannot meet their natural wealth household management needs because it's too expensive. And as a result, I have adult children living at home. Now, they're doing well and they're saving their money to get out there, but it's a lot harder than it used to be. So, Adam, I agree with you. All right. Um, excellent. Excellent, right? And by the way, there are a couple of nice real-world examples in there, so we're going to go ahead and throw that on up there. All right. So, yeah, there are risks to it. All right. Now, by the way, who was it that mentioned Seneca? Was it uh, Michael James? Um, Seneca has a quote about this. Funny that you should mention Seneca. It is not the man who has too little, but the man who craves more that is poor. The truth is, and we talked about this in, in past lectures, by just about every measure, you are rich. Throughout every measure that was used in human history, you're really well off. Now, I don't want to belittle your state. I really don't. Profit motive, which we're going to talk about in depth in this series, is, is a real thing. We want to always push forward. We always want more, and that's why you're in college right now. So hold on to that. Ambition is good. But if we looked at how we measured wealth all throughout the ages, access to clean water, access to food, water, um, you know, shelter and, and safety and transportation, security and, and free time to spend with family and friends and so forth, we're doing pretty darn sweet. Problem is, we don't think about it in those terms. We don't say, wow, gosh, compared to people in the 1800s, I'm doing really well. We don't compare ourselves to people in the 1800s. We compare ourselves to the people right across the street or to our friends who have moved on to other places or to our parents where they were in a certain time and so on. And so we tend to crave more. I do. I crave more. And I, I, I really want to change that. I'm actually actively working toward changing that. That's one of my goals. Um, so it is not the man who has too little, but the man who craves more that is poor. Just something to think about. Um, and, and I was marking it all up and you couldn't see a thing, but that's all right. You got it. So wrong button. By the way, one of the things that I crave more is I want a uh, stream deck. I got to get a stream deck so I don't keep making these mistakes. Anyway, guys, there you go. Great work. Um, consider these things. Play with these ideas. You know, remember, this is a critical thinking class. Don't just come back and say, Aristotle's a kook. He's an old man. Don't listen to him. On the other hand, don't say, oh, everything Aristotle says is right and so forth. Really think about how this applies to your life, to your career, to your goals, and to your ambitions. This has changed the way I think about a lot of things, and, uh, and I'd like to kind of see what you guys think as well. So um, feel free to play with the ideas, all right? So fantastic work. Send me that email with the timestamp, and uh, you guys have a great rest of the week, and we'll see you Monday, all right? Have a good one.